In this lecture, I'd like to give you a look at a bunch of other different languages, uh, both old dialects of existing languages, other styles of programming, and other languages that are used in, in other domains. Um, so I'm going to talk about different dialects of C and C++ and uh, spend a little bit of time on some other styles of programming, then bang through a couple of other languages that are sort of uh, that, that you may come across C sharp Swift JavaScript and PHP and then talk a little bit about scripting and, and other stuff like that so the first thing to talk about is this idea of different dialects of languages um, you're aware uh, in a bunch of the lectures I've talked about using C++ 11 uh, that's the 2011 version of the language um, and you can probably guess from that that there's other versions from other years and other editions of different languages, right? So there was the original Kernahan and Ritchie C uh, that was then standardized in the 80s uh, to something called ANSI C, the American National Standards Institute. Uh, there are actually several versions of ANSI C, depending on that. They usually it's uh, C99 means the, the standard that was issued in 1999. There are several different versions of C++, again, uh, with the year that they were standardized. Now, the interesting thing about these different languages is that it's almost never the case that something gets taken out of the language, but it's much more likely that new stuff will be added. Stuff won't get taken out because you don't want to uh, lose things that you had worked on previously, uh, you know, you need some backward compatibility. Uh, so if something used to work in the old version of the language, it should work in the new version of the language. Uh, and anything that would break that is something that people would be worried about adding. Um, sometimes people get inspired by other languages. So there are features from C++ that drifted back into C. Uh, one of them is inline, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but usually the changes across versions are additional keywords, additional library support, additional methods on existing um, libraries or classes. Uh, you may have seen if you were looking up things in the documentation that uh, there are certain methods that only exist in C++11, there are certain methods that only exist in C++17. So let's talk about um, uh, inlining. This was a, a, a problem that was created by the original and, and existed in the original version of, of C. Uh, the idea was that um, we were going to create preprocessor macros. Um, the idea behind a preprocessor pre macro is it's just simple textual replacement, one set of text for another with some argument substitution. Um, it looks like a function call, but it doesn't cost you anything like a function call. The preprocessor makes the necessary substitutions before the compilation. So in this example here, the first line, that pound define, I've defined a macro named isUpper. It takes a single parameter, x, and you can see there that everywhere it says isUpper x, the stuff on the right is what replaces it. So isUpper ch gets taken by the preprocessor and turned into if ch greater than or equal a and ch less than or equal to Z. So, you know, if, if it is an uppercase letter. Nice. You don't have to call a function. You don't have to do anything. Splendid. But it's not really a function. It's really just a copying of text. So, this might be a problem. Is upper star CP++. This becomes star CP++ greater than or equal to A and star CP++ less than or equal to Z. It looks like a function, but it's not a function. I've copied the text for that argument twice. I'm evaluating the plus plus twice, which is probably not what you mean. If it's a function, the argument would be evaluated once, the value would be copied into the function, and that copy would be used, but this isn't a function, so we don't have that. So um, expanding macros uh, with things that have side effects like that is, is really potentially perilous. So inline functions were created, and inline solve this. Um, I declare is upper to be a function that you know, takes an argument and returns something of a particular type, but I declare it to be inline, so I don't actually generate a function to be called. I 
put the body of the code into place and I behave like I'm a function call, but I don't actually have a function call. So in C++, she can do this. She can explicitly state that a function is to be expanded in line. Uh, that's a nice way of making sure that, you know, it looks like a function, it behaves like a function. So, so that's good. Um, and compilers may decide to do this all on their own. Uh, getters and setters in classes and, you know, small methods defined in classes are often inlined. Small functions are often inlined. So... That, among many other things, uh, turns out to be a fairly interesting and, and somewhat useful feature uh, that got added to C++ to solve a particular problem, and at some point it got absorbed back into C. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit, because we've talked about imperative programming, we've talked about object-oriented programming. There's other styles of programming. One of the styles of programming is called declarative. So in logic programming, we have what's called declarative semantics. We, we make statements that declare facts and declare relationships. Uh, there's no variables, really, or not in the same sense as imperative programs. There's just statements about things that are true, and there's no procedures. You simply state what you know and state what kind of a result you would like to see, and then let the system figure that out for you. Now this is illustratable in a really bizarre example here. We could use logic programming to sort a list. Now we all know from data structures how you sort a list, but logic programming here, we're not telling it how to sort a list, we're just describing a list. So if I've got an old list, and i got a new list, and I can somehow permute the old list into a new list, and the new list is sorted, that implies that the new list is sorted. So all you do is you say, for every permutation of the list into some other list, if that particular permutation is sorted, then it is true that new list is a sorted version of the old list. Yeah, that's, that sounds a little crazy, right? But that's, that's exactly what logic programming does for you, right? Uh, somehow you permute a list, and then you just check to see if it's sorted. If it's not, well, that was a bad choice. Try another permutation. You can imagine that this could potentially be wildly inefficient. Uh, and in fact, it's a particularly bad example of something that you do with logic programming because... Uh, sorting is pretty algorithmic, but there's other things that are not, okay? So, um, a good example of this is the programming language PROLOG. PROLOG stands for Programming with Logic. Uh, PROLOG is designed to let you express the problem you're trying to solve in a form of symbolic logic that's called the predicate calculus. You make a bunch of statements about things that are true. You make a bunch of statements about what logical inferences are valid. And then you specify something about the results you're like, you'd like. And the program runs. And the programs are theorem proofs. Given everything I know, and given all the things that I know how to infer, is the question that I'm asking you true? So, Prolog has... A small number of things. There are terms, a constant, a variable, or a structure, and a constant is like an, a, an atom, a word, or an integer, some kind of symbolic value. You can have variables, um, and you can have structures or collections of things together, right? Um, so variables, any string or letters and underscores, just has to begin with an uppercase letter. Um, you don't have variables in the same sense of declare this variable to have a particular type and set it equal to a particular value. You have instantiation as, as part of the process of proving things. At some point in the process, a particular value, variable might have a particular value bound to it, but you know, that'll, that maybe goes away later. And then there are structures which are just representations of propositions. Uh, this is best illustrated with an example. Here are a bunch of statements of fact 
in a prolog program. Okay, so you see they're all they're all functors, right? Functors with arguments. And you read this as you know, Shelley's a female, Bill is male. Bill and Jake have a father relationship one to the other. Bill's Jake's father. John's a student. And you notice down on the bottom, I've got three like relationships, right? Seth likes OS X, Nick likes Windows, Jim likes Linux. So there's a whole bunch of like relationships. All of those things are true. You know, I, I've shown an example here of, you know, one female and one male, but there can be, you know, thousands of females, thousands of males. Uh, all we know is, well, it's a fact that so-and-so is a male. It's a fact that so-and-so is a female. So, you know, with a whole bunch of facts like this, you can just search and, you know, find out if, if Shelly is a female. And, and if, the, if there's a fact that says that Shelly's a female, then you say that that's true. I've proved the theorem. It gets more interesting when you have rules, right? You, rules are used for the hypothesis and they're used for inferences. There's, a, there's an if part and there's a then part. A bunch of things that if they're true, then you can conclude that the other thing is true. Um, and you can have a single thing or you can have multiple things. Uh, again, this is best illustrated with an example. So the first rule says, um, uh, Mary, if Mary is Shelley's mother, then Mary is Shelley's ancestor, which you know, makes sense, right? Uh, uh, your mother is one of your ancestors, your father is one of your ancestors, and so that's, that's cool. But it really gets interesting, or more interesting, if you use variables to generalize the meaning. So the ro first rule says that if X is Y's mother... That implies that X is a parent of Y. If X is Y's father, this implies that X is a parent of Y. And that's true for all of the pairs that have the mother relationship, all of the pairs that have the father relationship. I don't have to enumerate them. I can infer them with these variables. It gets most interesting on the last one here where we talk, we have a rule for a grandparent. Now, the comma-separated list of things on the right is an and. This says... If X is a parent of Y, and Y is a parent of Z, then X is a grandparent of Z. Uh, and this is uh, you know, it's obvious, right? If, uh, your, your parent's parent is your grandparent, right? So this is these sorts of rules where you can, you have straightforward statements about what can and cannot be inferred from all of the stuff that you already know. Um, you can infer a lot of different things with a very small number of rules. Um, it turns out that when I taught myself Prolog, one of the things I did was I tried to figure out a, a program to prove things about who was related to who in what way. Um, so I have a very large extended family. Um, you know, when you have 80 first cousins and, and uh, uh, 22 aunts and uncles and all of those people have spouses and children and grandchildren themselves, you know, how exactly is this person related to the other person? So you, you make a bunch of statements of fact about who's who, and then you make a bunch of statements about if, if this relationship holds between these people, then you can say this about them. So it's a way of saying, uh, because of this and because of this, um, my son is second cousins to my cousin's kid, for example. And you don't have to enumerate all the combinations. You just specify the rules and ask it to prove stuff for you. Asking it to prove stuff for you generally involves asking a question, right? So, um, is Fred a man? Right? Man, Fred, question mark. Uh, that searches the rule base and tries to find out if Fred's a man. And, and if he is, it says yes. And if he's not, it says no. Now, you can have conjunctions, and these things are also um, just as legal, right? So, um, is Mike's father wealthy? Uh, X is a father to Mike, and the comma means and. So, X is a father to Mike, and X is wealthy. So, that's saying, is Mike's father wealthy? Is there an X such that X is the father of Mike, and X is wealthy? Right? So... When I ask Prolog to prove this, 
It'll search through the set of all possible facts that it has and tell me if it's true or not. And if it is true, it'll tell me the value for x that makes it true. And there might be multiple values of x or multiple values of the variables. Right? The process of doing the proof is called resolution. Uh, you, you resolve the various statements. You find values for variables that allow the matching to succeed. You assign temporary variables to allow you to continue searching through. And you, you get to a conclusion, or you don't. And if you fail to get to a conclusion, then you go back to a, uh, a decision that you made about instantiating a particular variable with a particular value. And you throw that away and you try something else. Um, this basically allows you to search lots and lots and lots of different things. It allows you to reconsider previous choices that you made. Uh, allows you to pick up where search is left off. Um, but it's non-algorithmic, right? It's not driven by, you know, it's not a depth-first search or a breadth-first search or any of the things that you might have learned in algorithms. Uh, it's potentially somewhat inefficient. But you don't have to worry about what the structure of the program is. You just let it prove things. Um, Prolog has arithmetic, but it does it in a weird way. You say that uh, if you have a certain number of, uh, of values, variables or constants, that can be um, that can be applied to, to each other with using addition and subtraction and division and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can say that the value of performing those arithmetic operations um, is the value of some variable. But that's not assignment. Right? In our proof, whenever we have a value for b and a value for c, a is b divided by 17 plus c. So uh, an example might make this clear. I have a database uh, with eight facts in it. Um, four facts about the speed that four different cars can go, four facts about the time that four different cars were driven. And then I make up a rule that says the distance that x, if, if I want to, I want to say that uh, there's a relationship called distance between x and y. So if a particular car goes at a particular speed and that same car goes at that speed for a certain amount of time, then y is speed times time. So whatever value might be found for speed, and whatever value might be found for time, the thing will calculate for whatever instantiation you've got for speed and time what y is and return it. So if I ask, what's Chevy distance if I I'm driving my Chevy, and it'll figure out, well, hmm, what's the Chevy's speed? Notice capital speed, speed's a variable, and it's Chevy speed's 105. What's the Chevy time? Chevy time is 21. So uh, Chevy speed times Chevy time is 2,205. So it will say, yes, this is true, and it's true when Chevy distance is 2,205. Now, if there were multiple extra facts in here, uh, and multiple answers that would make this true, you could force Prolog to keep searching and find other variables. Another example to sort of illustrate this, um, I just want to introduce to you that there's a, there's a trace capability in a lot of these languages, so I can tell Prolog to be verbose as it tries to solve problems. So here's an example of Prolog being verbose when it tries to solve problems. I have four facts. I have two things that Jake likes, and I have two things that Darcy likes, and I turn tracing on. And then I want to see if there's something that both Jake likes and Darcy likes. So notice the first thing is likes Jake X, comma means and, and the second thing is likes Darcy X. So the thing is going to exhaustively search through all the facts. So uh, it calls, well, what does Jake like? Oh, Jake likes chocolate. Well, this would be true if Darcy also likes chocolate. Does Darcy like chocolate? No. So, that was a bad choice. Pick the next thing. 
Now the next thing is Jake likes apricots. Does, does Darcy like apricots? Yeah, she does. Darcy does like apricots. Therefore, likes Jake X and likes Darcy X is true when X equals apricots. There's other uh, operations built into um, Prologue that are uh, entertaining to look at. Um, there are lists, uh, square bracket enclosed, comma separated um, things are, are lists. And you can have empty lists and you can have built into the system uh, the notion that you want to look at the head of the list, you want to look at the tail of the list. This is similar to the stuff we talked about with Lisp. This notation lets you do really simple descriptions of fairly complicated list operations like appending things to a list or returning things to it, uh, or reversing a list, right? So we make two statements about appending, right? If I take an empty list and I append list to it, the result is list. Makes sense. If the first thing has the second thing appended to it, right? Um, then you can simply crank through and append pieces, right? So if I can, if you look at the, the line here, it says the first argument is head followed by list one. And then list two is appended to that. And then we say, okay, well, if head followed by list one is the first argument and list two is the um, second argument, well, the result is head, the beginning of list one, followed by list three. What is list three? Well, list three is list one with list two appended to it, and the result is list three. And that's recursive, right? So if list one has five items in it, then append list one will have four items in it, then three items in it, then eventually it'll work its way down to being the first rule, empty list. And then as it unwinds itself, you, you can see that uh, eventually you will have a fully formed list where the first argument has the second argument appended to it. And similar ideas to um, reverse. The reverse of an empty list is list. Um, Reversing can be described as, uh, in, in terms of reversing the tail of the list and then appending the head of the list to the reverse tail. So this is cool, I suppose. It's a little odd. It's probably something you've never really seen before. Um, and it has some problems. You have no control over what it's doing and how it works and how quickly it works. Um, so it's not necessarily the most efficient way of doing things. Um, and there are um, a couple things that are related to each other. These are not just problems with Prolog. They're, they're problems with logic programming systems in general. The closed world assumption. Uh, the only knowledge that, that Prolog has is what's in the database. The only facts it has is the, the, the facts that you gave it, and the only things it can infer are the inferences that you told it were valid. That's all fine. But related to that is what's called the negation problem. Anything not stated in the database is assumed to be false. So you might say something is true or false, but what you really are saying is, as far as I know, as far as all the information I have right now, I can't prove it's true. Therefore, it must be false. And there's some other sort of in intrinsic limitations to this in, in the sense that um, certain things that are algorithmic are easy to do in an imperative programming language and really difficult and hard to follow in a logic programming language. Um, it doesn't know how to sort, right? It doesn't know how to efficiently do stuff like that. But that's not the kind of problem that you, you try and solve with it. Logic programming is used in things like relational database management systems. If you've studied databases, you know that uh, queries can be expressed as logic proofs, right? And so that, that really is very much a, a sort of declaring the logic of what you would like to be true about the relations in the database. Um, logic programming is used in 
various kinds of expert systems, various kinds of natural language processing. It's very much something uh, that's heavily used in the artificial intelligence domain. Um, and so if you're, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you might come across Prolog. There's another style of programming, the last style of programming uh, that I'm going to briefly mention here. It's called functional programming. Um, in functional programming, all computation is the evaluation of a mathematical function. There's no notion of keeping track of the state of things or changing states. There's just a bunch of functions that are executed. There's not mutable data. Uh, functions don't have side effects. You do an evaluation, and that's the answer, and that's it. Now, there are a lot of different languages that provide this, and they're becoming more and more popular as, as, uh, as time goes on. Um, one of the more popular recent ones is a language called Haskell. Um, Haskell's a person's name, um, so the language is named after him. Um, Haskell is a functional language. It's focused on evaluating expressions. Uh, it's pure, right? There's no side effects. There's no global data. Uh, everything's immutable. That's great. Um, there's also this idea of lazy evaluation. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Nothing is evaluated until it's needed, and it's statically typed. So let me give you a couple of examples. The first line here, take 10, repeat 5. Um, well, that's a Haskell program, right? Repeat 5 means repeat 5 an infinite number of times. And then just take the first 10 elements of those. Now, if you're writing in an imperative programming language, you know how to write an infinite loop to generate a whole bunch of fives, but, but you don't know how to get in there and just take the first 10 of them. Um, Haskell is structured to handle this. Uh, it does it lazily. So the idea that repeat five is a function that just keeps spitting out fives over and over and over and over and over again, but it doesn't actually generate the fives unless the underlying system asks it to. Um, list comprehensions, the second line. Um, this is uh, something you may have seen in Python, and we talked about this in Python. Um, you, you talk about what's in a list, and you talk about how you derive what's in the list, right? So um, you read this as, uh, give me a list of the square of x such that x is in the range of numbers from 1 to 10, and x squared is less than 15. So it's going to evaluate that uh, x from 1 to 10. Uh, it's like a loop, only it's not expressed as a loop because there's no way of doing it, right? Um, and so you, you, you take 1 and you square it. If it's less than 15, then you take that x and you square it and you put it in the list. The entirety of the lifetime of the variable x is inside that square bracket. Another slightly more complicated version. Um, give me uh, a tuple ABC representing right triangles whose perimeter is 24. So there you go, C, B, and A. Um, a squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. So it's a right triangle and a plus b plus c is equal to 24. So this is exhaustively going through this stuff, right? It's, it's going to generate you know, all c's, and then for each value of c, all b's, and then for each value of b, all a's. Do the test, and if it works, save the a, b, c in the list. So Haskell has static typing, it has lists, it has tuples, it has a map function which is different from the map that we learned in C++. Apply a function to every element in the list to get a new list. So this says, map the function, plus 3, to the list 271. That is to say, add 3 to each element in the list. So the result of map plus 3, 271, gives you the list 5, 2 plus 3, 10, 7 plus 3, and 4, 1 plus 3. And there's also a filter operation. Apply a predicate to every item in the list, and if the predicate's true, the thing in the old list ends up in the new list. So this lets you do some stuff in a very interesting way. This is quicksort written in Haskell, written in a functional programming language. Okay, So 
the first line is a definition. This is quicksort. Uh, can be applied to any ordered type A, anything that less than is equal to or greater than works on. And when you give it a list of A, it produces a list of A. The second line says the quicksort of an empty list is equal to an empty list. And the third thing that says a quicksort that starts with a list that starts with X and ends with XS is, um, well, we use the let statement. We say SM is a quick sort of filter less than or equal to X, XS. What does that mean? Apply the predicate less than or equal to X to the list XS gives me a new list, which I then give to quick sort. So that's your quicksort algorithm partition into a list of things that's less than or equal to the pivot. And the second line says apply the predicate greater than x to xs. Find everything in xs that is greater than x and take that new resulting list and give to quicksort. So now all of a sudden I've got sm and lg, which are the pivots. SM is all the items in XS that are less than or equal to X. LG is all the items in XS that are greater than X. And then I can say um, the result is SM, the left partition, concatenated with the list X, concatenated with LG, the rightmost partition. So you let SM and LG have those values just in that expression. And that's what quicksort is. And so you can see it, it's, it's recursive, um, just, like, uh, just like the quicksort algorithm is defined. You know, you find a pivot, you partition the, the list into two items, you recursively quicksort each piece, and you combine things together. Cool. There's a bunch of other languages, and, and Haskell is much more than just these couple of slides. And there's a couple of other languages that we might... Um, might uh, want to talk about at some other point. Um, there's languages like Julia and older languages like ML and standard ML, uh, but Haskell's fairly popular and you might, yeah, you might come across it. Now I want to touch on a couple of little things about other languages, right? Uh, mentioned C Sharp a couple times, developed by Microsoft, uh, designed to run inside their common language runtime, uh, based on Windows, and there's a common platform that handles all kinds of stuff like exceptions and garbage collection and security and all that jazz. Looks a lot like C++ with a couple of differences. Um, they decided for weird ways, the weird weird reasons that I don't quite understand, to handle multi-dimensional arrays slightly differently. Um, they support interface from Java. They support type safe function pointers. They support overriding. Uh, one entertaining thing is that they allow pointers. They allow you to use pointers, but you can only use pointers in certain areas, and those areas have to be marked unsafe. Literally, there's a keyword unsafe. Um, my guess is that they want to warn the runtime that memory in that area might have been changed and can't be garbage collected. Uh, I don't know. But I, I continue to find it entertaining that to use pointers in this language, I have to say that it's unsafe. Another interesting language that is relatively new is a programming language called Swift. Um, Apple used to do all of its development for iPhones and iPads and iPods in a language called Objective C. Um, Objective C is a very difficult language to write in. It's not very strongly typed. A bunch of different issues with it. So they decided that what they wanted to do was take the best of C and the best of C++ and the best of Objective C, but not hold on to C backward compatibility like C++ did and like Objective C did. Um, and also, since they weren't holding on to that compatibility, uh, maybe there's some other things that they could, they could add to the language to make a little, things a little bit more nice. So, so they, have, um, they have types and they have constants, 
but they handle them slightly differently. Um, if I say so, if I say let let x equal something, um, I'm saying that x is a constant. Um, I can say that it's not a constant, but it's a variable var, and var in Swift works like auto does in C++. If I say var x equals 10, the Swift compiler says, oh, 10, it's an integer. Must be an integer. That's what you want. Um, you can, if you want to, explicitly specify the type by saying uh, colon type name. They have strings and they have collections, but they're basic types in the language. They're, they're not extra funky add-on things. And you got closures in the language. Um, function arguments can actually have keywords, right? One of the really cooler things about Swift is they have this idea of uh, option types. Uh, I like to think about this as it's an uninitialized variable. I don't quite know anything about this thing yet. It's, it's different from a variable that's been set to zero. It hasn't been set to anything at all. And so there's special operators to get at these variables and built-in things that are really handy to allow you to uh, be a little bit more safe about the use of uninitialized variables and uh, to have some of the code be a little cleaner, right? So exclamation point accesses the value of one of these option things. Question mark accesses the value but only goes ahead if there's actually a value. So first example here, an optional instance bang dot some method. So if an optional instance doesn't have a value associated with it, then there'll be a null pointer exception here. But here I can say an optional instance question mark some method. So this is like saying if an optional instance has a value, then dereference it and call some method. So this is kind of nice. The, the, the code's a lot smaller and a lot cleaner. Um, and it's particularly nice when you have a chain of things here, right? So uh, what does this say here? The least start is take a building, um, go to tenant list sub 5 if it exists, and go to lease details if they exist, and get the start date. So if tenant list 5 is valid and lease details is valid, you get the start date. Otherwise, you'll get an option type that doesn't have a value. So this is a lot cleaner than if this pointer is valid, then dereference it and find out if that pointer is valid, and then dereference it and find out if that pointer is valid. It's a nice, compact uh, operation. Swift has classes, single inheritance. You extend classes, like you do in Java. It has protocols, which is a, a sort of an interface. Think of it as an interface. They don't use the keyword this. They use the keyword self. Not that really big a deal. Um, one of the cool things that you can do in the language, and this is really handy in, in uh, various kinds of GUI things and communication things, you can set observers on variables. Right? So um, if I want to, I can have code that's executed just before a value of a variable is set. And I can have code that's called just after the value of a variable is set. So all kinds of extra functionality can be transparently added to some kind of a user interface by triggering an observer. One other interesting thing is um, that they have a slightly different syntax uh, for control structures. They always require curly braces. You know, if you say if x, y, and, you know, in C++, you can say if left paren x is equal to 3, right paren y equals 5. Or you can take that y equals 5 and then close it in curly braces. Swift requires you to enclose it in curly braces. Since Swift requires you to close it in curly, enclose it in curly braces, the Swift compiler knows exactly where the conditional piece ends and the body of the if begins, so parens aren't required. So instead of saying if left paren x is equal to 3, right paren do something, 
I can say if x is equal to 3 with no parens, but I've got to follow it with a curly brace. Of course, you can always parenthesize an expression so the parens are valid, but they're not required. Uh, they also have, since they have the, the uh, various collections built into the language, they have iterators built into the language in a nice, clear way. You know, for x and y, uh, similar to the way that it works in Python, and slightly similar to the, you know, the way that you can do it in C++, but this is a lot cleaner. Uh, they have operator overloading, which is great. They do automatic reference, automatic reference counting in a very efficient way, so memory management is a lot better in Swift. It's pretty cool. One interesting oddity is um, they add new operators that keep track of arithmetic overflow. So if I say just plain old addition, A plus B, and I overflow, the, the result would overflow an integer. Uh, the runtime will detect it, and the operation won't be performed, and I'll, I'll get some kind of an error. But if I say instead of A plus B, A ampersand plus b, that means uh, do the addition, and it's okay if there's an overflow, truncate it. So that's pretty cool, actually, and kind of interesting, uh, and, and useful in certain mathematical programming applications. Uh, having to do things like this in C++ involves all kinds of stuff to make sure that you detect overflow and handle it properly. Here, it's delightfully built into the language, so that's pretty cool. Now let's switch gear a little bit to some other kinds of languages uh, that you might come across uh, that are more used for scripting. Uh, JavaScript, you may have heard of. It's a scripting language that's built into web browsers. Um, there is a JavaScript interpreter built into each web browser that you're running. Um, if you've ever looked at HTML code and you see things in uh, HTML directives where you say things like uh, on click equals something or other or, or on mouse over something or other or, or, or whatever. Um, those are the hooks between HTML and JavaScript. Uh, you can cause a piece of JavaScript code to be executed when somebody clicks a mouse on something or when somebody mouses over something. Uh, the HTML uh, that's involved when you, you know, you go to a website and you, you mouse over a picture and suddenly the picture gets bigger. That's because somebody has written code to handle on mouse over. Somebody moused over the picture, so there's something to do. Um, JavaScript has programmatic access to um, something called the DOM, right? The Basically, the internal in the web page data structure that represents the entirety of your web page. Uh, the titles, all the headings, all the paragraphs, all the text, blah, blah, blah. You can write JavaScript code to change the content to your web page or change the style sheets that the web page uses or that individual pieces of the, the web page uses. So that's how you mouse over a picture and make it bigger. The on mouse over event goes into the domain object model and finds the information for the thing you've moused over and just changes its style so that it looks a little bigger. Um, this kind of stuff is really um, useful in websites. And so a whole bunch of people have written code packages and things. There's a, there's a cool library called jQuery, which just makes uh, JavaScript and self-modifying web pages a lot easier to write, it's cool, and it's not Java. Another language that you may come across in your travels uh, is a language called PHP. PHP used to stand for Personal Home Page. Now it just stands for PHP. Uh, PHP runs in a web server. Okay, and generally speaking, the output of a PHP program must be HTML or, or must fit into an HTML page in some way. If you go to Pipeline, Highlander Pipeline, and you look at the URL, it's index.php. That means that your the Highlander Pipeline web page is actually a PHP program. When you go to the web server, 
it executes the web page as a PHP program, and the output of that program is the HTML that is sent to you. That's how you can log into Pipeline, you give it a, you know, you give it your UCID and password, and another PHP program executes to take what you typed in, look you up in a database, and custom generate the, the content that you see in Pipeline. Um, anybody who's ever used any of these web CMSs, Drupal, WordPress, any of these other ones, they're all basically PHP programmers and PHP programming environments with hooks built into it. So um, if somebody offers you a Drupal job, you're going to be a PHP programmer. And PHP can be very intertwined in with HTML. So this example here shows how uh, I can enclose a piece of PHP code in a directive, less than question mark PHP is the beginning, question mark greater than is the end. When the web browser, excuse me, when the web server reads this, it interprets that piece of PHP code and does what it says. So this will have a header my page that says hello world. The HTML and the body and the my page stuff uh, comes right from this file. Hello world is echoed as part of the output of PHP. So you can, you know, uh, uh, print the current date or print all kinds of stuff like that by writing a little PHP program and just have it echo its output and that output will just appear on a web page. Now, I think you can see that some of this stuff is a little complicated, right? You can have PHP on the server side. You can have JavaScript on the client side. Your web page might have HTML. It might have JavaScript. It might have PHP. It might have CSS all in one file. There are, as we know, different versions of HTML. Different support for different versions of HTML and CSS by different browsers. Yeah, there's different versions of CSS, too. Um, so... The complexity of, of web development, web design, and web testing means that well, a lot of us will be employed for a long time. Um, there's a, a, a whole bunch of ideas about cleaning this stuff up and making it better and unifying these things a little bit more. But, you know, this has sort of grown in a really ad hoc way and different pieces have have uh, been added on to different other pieces, and so the sort of the the interoperability and the interdependencies between these things, uh, I think they're going to be with us for a while. Now there are other scripting languages too, not used in in web environments, although although they can be used in web environments. And if you take CS two eighty eight, you might come across um, the shell. The shell is uh, the command line interpreter that's built into, uh, that comes with Unix uh, and Linux. And if you take a bunch of commands, put them in a file, and execute that file, you've got a shell script. You can have a list of commands executed by just saying the name of the file that has the commands in it, right? So, Shell can be just a list of commands, but it's got other things too. It's got, it's got variables. It's got looping constructs. It's you know, it's got all that sort of stuff. It has some primitives for I/O redirection. Uh, if I say less than or greater than, the shell sets up where, uh, where different programs will take input from, where different programs will send output to. Um, if you look at the build scripts in Vocarium, if you look at the run case scripts in Vocarium and all that sort of stuff, it's all, all of it, just shell scripts with setting variables, remembering variables, and looping. One other thing that's useful um, in, in Unix systems is this notion of pipelining. Sometimes I want to run two programs, and I want the output of one program to be the input of another program, that's a pipeline. Now, we, we like this because sort of the Unix programming philosophy is that, there, that 
Unix comes with a bunch of simple little utilities that do simple things. They read standard input, they write standard output. And you, know, you have just general utilities that let you do things like, oh, find me all the lines of text in this file that match this. Or uh, give me just the first three columns of this. Or you know, take this stuff and put it in order. Um, and the idea is that you could write custom programs to do all this stuff, but you can take the existing pieces and, and assemble them together in, in a pipeline. So how do I figure out how many people are logged onto this computer? Well, uh, I don't know, but I have a program that tells me who's logged on and it prints out one line per person. And then I have another program that counts lines. Generally speaking, just takes its input, counts how many lines there are, and prints out a number. So if I take the output of the who program that says who's logged in, and I pipe it into the line counting program, and I run both those programs together through that pipeline, the answer is the number of lines in who, which is the number of people logged in. Uh, other more complicated things, right? What processes have been running on this machine for a long time? Well, I don't know, but I have a program that tells me everything that's running on this machine, and I can uh, sort that so I can say, well, what are the top five longest running programs on the machine? Tell me all the programs that are running on the machine, sort them by runtime in descending order, and print out the first five lines. And that is the five longest running programs. Um, learning to do shell scripting is a very, very valuable skill to have in your bag of tricks. Uh, there's a lot of very sophisticated things that you can do uh, built out of a bunch of really small, uh, uh, straightforward tools. There are other more general purpose Unix scripting languages. There's a programming language called Perl. Um, it's very C-like. It's got variables and expressions and assignments and code blocks and curly braces and functions. and It's cool. There's another scripting language called awk which, again, has C structures, associative arrays are built in. It has built-in regular expression matching. Um, and it's structured around uh, doing something a line at a time. Right? So uh, an awk program is written such that you say, here's what I want to do for each line of text. And the program automatically reads in a line, and gives it to the awk program, breaks it up into words. Um, you know, you can you can uh, change one word to another. You can find all lines that have five words on them and print them out, or or count them or whatever. Um, it's built in a very general purpose way. So most of these languages that we've talked about, um, pretty much all semester, right, have been in some way general purpose languages, right? Even languages that are custom designed for um, uh, the web, right? And have certain web things built in are really general purpose. But languages are used in a lot of different places and in a lot of different ways, and they're not necessarily limited to general purpose programming languages. Um, there's ideas uh, in this area uh, come mostly from a paper uh, written by a guy named John Bentley back in the 80s. Uh, he used to write a column for the communications of the ACM called Programming Pearls, and in one of these columns he talked about little languages. Sometimes the problem that you're trying to solve is best solved by writing an interpreter for a little language. Um, this might be like really customized to a particular use, uh, this might be somewhat general purpose, but for a very, very narrow domain. Um, being able to do this is occasionally very useful. So, for example, um, if you are interested in computer networking, you'll teach yourself a scripting language called NS that was custom written to do network simulations. Um, write a description of your network in terms of, you know, routers and links and, and, uh, and pipes from one place to another and simulate traffic in the network and see what happens. Um, 
there's other customized things for, for pictures. Uh, something that I came across several years ago, and I've used it a lot in a bunch of different places, is a little language for drawing pictures. Uh, this is called DAG, Directed Acyclic Graph. So here's an example of a DAG program. Uh, all I'm saying here is, this is a directed graph. A is a link to B, B is a link to C. Go and draw it. And the input to the DAG program is, uh, is this, and the output is a JPEG with that picture on the bottom. So a lot of these pictures that I've used either here or uh, you know in other papers I've written and stuff like that uh, use this little language. It's not a general purpose programming language, but in this narrow domain of helpfully drawing pictures, it's very useful. So you may come across these different general purpose languages. You may come across some of these specific languages. And you may even, depending on what your work is, you may even decide that what you're going to do is write your own little language. Uh, and you, when you do that, you will be writing a language that has syntax, semantics, names, and types, just like every other one of these programming languages has.